And we are live. Hi there. Uh, my name is Eric Mack. I'm a contributor to CNET's Crave blog. And joining you here in the Google Plus Hangout today, uh, I'm here in Taos, New Mexico. And joining me in the Hangout from, I assume, New York City is jo Jonathan Keats, experimental philosopher and creator of the Quantum ATM that we're going to learn about today. Jonathan, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me on. You got it. You got it. So this this is very interesting. Um, what you're working on, it it kind of meets the intersection of uh, art and technology and science, and I, I suppose uh, social commentary as well. So I, I'm going to try and explain what I understand the quantum ATM to be. Uh, I'm far from a quantum physicist. I can hold some of these concepts in my mind, but I'm definitely going to get uh, you know a lot of the language wrong, probably. Uh, so if you are a quantum physicist out there watching this, uh, please bear with me. I apologize. But from what I understand, so so this is an ATM, an automated uh, teller machine uh, that's going to be installed uh, at 20 Rockefeller Center tomorrow in New York City, and so this ATM will take in currency, you know, real world currency, um, most probably dollars, and then inside the core of the ATM uh, there is a, a uranium glass ball of sorts that will uh, somehow, the system takes in the money uh, and transfers it, theoretically, to uh, a uranium particle that's then emitted but a glass shell of some sort comes down over it, so uh, technically it's unobservable and held in a quantum superposition in which it can be all places at once and is then projected onto uh, seven million tiny uh, inscripted boxes at once. Um, we got a dog here, crediting it, uh, crediting it to those seven billion accounts and therefore proliferating, you know, this dollar more or less infinitely. Now that's my probably. Uh, terrible elementary explanation. What did I leave out, or what did I get wrong? I think that it was a really good explanation, better than I could probably do. Uh, there are actually seven billion boxes. At billion, one sorry. Everyone on the planet, and the ATM is hardly automatic at this stage. It is a more of an accounting system where you leave money in a pile and take your quantum banknotes in exchange. And everything is incredibly rudimentary, largely because uh, the quantum bank is, at this stage, it's me. Uh, in the future, I hope that Bank of America or Wells Fargo will take on this technology and develop it, or perhaps the Fed or the World Bank. But right now, we're really kind of at the prototype stage. I, I believe that everything will work in terms of what anyone might possibly want out of such a machine, but it doesn't work very quickly or, efficiency, or efficiently. And I think that probably if we had 7 billion customers, one um, account for everyone on Earth, probably our system would fail. And so here we've got we've got a shot here. This is this is the uh, kind of the inner core of, of what we're talking about here. Um, and, and I understand you you have some some pieces of this there that haven't been installed yet. Can you show us what you have there with you? Certainly, uh, the uranium glass sphere is inside a uh, cylinder that is inscribed with the seven billion boxes. And the sphere, if I hold this up, you can see the slightly greenish tint, which is the uranium ore that gives it that color. Obviously, since I'm holding this in my hand, we're talking about a very low level of radioactivity, which is ideal because deposits, as I mentioned, are going to happen relatively slowly. Uh, they're done by hand, and you have to fill out the uh, count book yourself. Um, this is all very low tech, though with a high tech potential to it. So whenever you decide to deposit whatever you like, you do so and you fill out the account book and then you have the option of also withdrawing. So the total amount that has been deposited, when, whenever you make a deposit of a dollar, let's say, that the first alpha particle that is emitted by the uranium glass sphere is the one which accounts for which account that dollar goes into. And since 
the sphere is contained inside a box that is metal and therefore that it becomes impossible for any measurement to be made rather than passing through just one of the seven billion boxes or one of the seven billion accounts it will be in a superposition where it will occupy all seven billion accounts at once. The result of that is that all seven billion accounts hold that dollar. So you can open an account and not deposit a dollar but you still have the right to withdraw a dollar and so do I and so does everybody else. So the total amount that is deposited becomes the total amount that any one person can withdraw. Not in dollars because dollars are going to be obsolete but rather in quanta, in quantum currency which is printed uh, by the bank. These are bank notes and our printing technology is also rather rudimentary. It's a rubber stamp and it's all self-serve so you'll just go ahead and stamp your own and Ideally, this will all work on trust, uh, at least at this early stage. I think that as we ramp up to 7 billion people, perhaps there will need to be some sort of safeguards in place. So all of this will happen in the basement, and it will happen, as I say, more or less automatically in terms of the emission of the alpha particle, but rather manually as far as everything else is concerned. And, and, and so, you know, obviously the, the, the question um, I've been getting from people as well, you know, of, of course, you know, the currency system is based on trust and, and there has to be, you know, an accepted currency and, and you know, this isn't obviously uh, an, an accepted currency just yet, although, you know, <laughs> neither was Bitcoin a couple of years ago. So uh, are, are you working at all on getting any, uh, any establishments to accept quantum currency or where does this go next? I think that it's a matter of volume. Once quantum currency starts circulating, once uh, the ATM is set up and people start taking this currency and trying to spend it, I think that it advertises itself, much as Bitcoin has done. And, you know, you take this money, this, these quantum bills to uh, the grocery store, for instance, and most likely they're going to be a little bit skeptical at first. But I think that explaining to them that they too can go and make a deposit, sign up for an account, and start withdrawing from everybody's account all at once. Even taking this, qu the, the, taking this quantum bill and depositing it, that would be the same thing as depositing a dollar since the quantum and the dollar are tied to each other at this point in terms of value. That they could do that, that would be a strong incentive for them to join the quantum gold rush, this, uh, this revolution in finance. So I think it will be self-perpetuating. And with seven billion people potentially doing it, uh, even the conservative banks, even the Fed, really won't have any choice but to go along with it. And so this isn't like the first uh, existential scale uh, project that, that you've done, uh, this being kind of a getting to the existential root of our uh, economy, I suppose. But you've also done, uh, in the past, you've tried to, uh, I believe, genetically engineer God. Is that right? T tell me a little bit about your background and, you know, kind of, what, what you're all about, what's the message you're trying to get out through your projects? Well, yes, it is true that um, genetically engineering God with, uh, in a collaboration with scientists at UC Berkeley, that was a project from some years ago, and I was in fact trying to figure out where on the phylogenetic tree amongst all the various species, where you might put God, and so I was using a process called continuous in vitro evolution, working with various candidate species, um, since I couldn't obtain DNA for God, obviously, trying to figure out through this process of continuous in vitro evolution which might be the most uh, likely relationship to extant species, the species with, with which we interact on a daily basis. So that really, I think, is typical, maybe, of what I am doing more broadly. I am... I call myself an experimental philosopher because I really don't know what else to call myself. And I studied philosophy in school and grew a bit frustrated, I think, with the fact that it was taking place largely or almost exclusively within an academic setting, a conversation between academics on subjects that were increasingly scholarly and therefore disconnected from everyday life. And to me, philosophy seems like it should be something that everyone should be partaking in and it should encompass absolutely everything in the world. So I sort of stole the idea of the thought experiment, which is typically done in writing in a, in a journal, where you posit a counterfactual situation, a parallel 
world where everything is more or less the same except you tinker with things just a little bit in order to be able to explore ideas from a different perspective to um, ask what if. And I took that out of academia and put it in the world where I attempted to actually do those experiments for real. Basically to set up a, a parallel world in our world where people could interact in some way with some sort of idea that in some way is reflective of perhaps ways in which we are thinking without really thinking about it. And it would allow them to, allow me as well, allow all of us to enter into a conversation about it. So I'm the cheapest laborer available and that means that one day I'm attempting to genetically engineer God, another day I am, well for example I made pornography for plants once. I um, I felt that getting into the film industry seemed kind of interesting, but there were a lot of other people like uh, Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas that beat me to it, but other species were not being catered to, plants among them, and there are many more plants than there are humans. And plants are kind of an ideal audience when you think about it for, for movies. They perform photosynthesis. They really experience the light. So I went and started out in pornography, as many filmmakers do. I started filming bees pollinating flowers out in the wild, titillating stuff if you happen to be a plant. And then I projected that onto the foliage of some houseplants that never get out. So I opened a porn theater for plants, uh, initially in Chico, California, and since then it's been in places from Bozeman, Montana to, um, to Brooklyn, New York. So kind of seems to be popular, if not with plants, then with people who have plants. It becomes however, not only a form of titillation for plants, but a sort of thought experiment, a way in which we can step outside of our everyday mediated experience of the world and watching another organism that is not like us, that we don't think of as being like us, having this sort of mediated experience, it becomes a way in which we can think about the degree to which our experience of the world is and is not entirely real. Uh, there's more to it than that potentially. I simply set up the experiment and let it go. And any interpretation, any ideas are fair play. But as the experimental philosopher standing outside of it, not a plant pornographer who's working very sincerely to titillate the plants as best as I can, but as the experimental philosopher standing outside of it, I'm interested in setting up this scenario that people can enter into, much in the same way that, for instance, a science fiction writer often will, like William Gibson or someone like this, will set up a world that has a kinship to ours but that takes things in a slightly different direction that makes us a little bit less comfortable with the things that we otherwise would take for granted. Has any uh, secondary industry of uh, plastic surgery for pollinators sprung up yet? <laughs> Not yet, but I think that you might be the first one to have come up with it, so you should go with it immediately. All of my projects, I should say, are totally open source, and I don't at all intend to be anything more than the cheapest available labor to set up these thought experiments and let them go. I, I think that it would be great if other people were to get into movies for plants, and I've actually, because no one else was doing so, I started making travel documentaries for plants, filming skies in foreign locations and allowing plants vicariously to experience Italy while in New York, for instance. Um, there's a lot more out there, though, and I invite others to take these ideas and make various permutations on them. They Certainly, almost anyone with a camera can make a better movie than I can. In the first place, technically speaking, the plants will be very happy, I'm sure, for others to take this up, but also because I think that these thought experiments really can go in directions that I could never have imagined or predicted they're bigger than I am, and that really involves the sort of open source spirit of allowing others to partake. Well, Google, take note. We need Google Glass that hooks around branches uh, so that the plants can uh, enjoy augmented reality, too. Uh, Jonathan Keats, any, any final words on uh, the Quantum ATM? I know it's going to be installed uh, there at, the, I believe, it's the Engineer's Office Gallery in 20 Rockefeller in uh, New York City tomorrow. Uh, what else can you tell us that you hope folks get out of this particular uh, experiment? Well, I don't want to say too much because I want to leave it open for others to experience, interpret, and for the conversation to be one that is 
genuinely a back and forth rather than by saying that this project is about one or another thing. It certainly is not satire. It certainly is not uh, didactic. There's no hidden message and I'm not making fun of anybody. What I'm interested in is the way in which money works and I don't know how it works. I don't think anyone really understands economics at a very deep level. So I'm setting up a thought experiment that allows us to step outside of the economics as we know it and yet at the same time that I hope follows the logic of economics which is that economics economies are supposed to be based on reality and the reality of our time is quantum so by making economics quantum I think it becomes a way in which to ask questions about the nature of money and the way in which in which economies relate to reality while at the same time of course asking some questions about about quantum physics uh, this area in physics that really like economics nobody actually genuinely understands even though many can make incredible predictions with it can do incredible work with it because you're actually interacting with it at the level of something as banal as as money I think that there's a way in which the discomfort the the, the weirdness of the quantum world maybe kind of comes out into the open and we can grapple with the ideas of what does it mean to live in a quantum world. It's, it's certainly uh, the quantum world, especially when applied to economics, you could definitely make the argument it's certainly no more weird than uh, you know derivatives trading that's been going on over the last decade that I don't think anyone can explain. Exactly. I, I wish I could come up with something as weird as derivatives, but I'm not that imaginative. <laughs> well, Jonathan Keats, uh, thank you so much for uh, telling us about the quantum ATM. Uh, w what time is, is the uh, installation going to uh, be official on Tuesday? We will launch on Tuesday at 1 o'clock p.m. and it will be open during ordinary business hours um, between Tuesday and Friday. So it will be a three-day preliminary trial and after that I am hoping if uh, the Federal Reserve is listening or the World Bank, this is your opportunity. The technology is available and I'll even throw in the uranium glass sphere. All right. Yes. Sounds, like a, sounds like a good offer to me. Uh, thanks again and thanks to uh, everyone who uh, is watching us here live on YouTube and on CNET. Um, and be sure to keep checking back with um, CNET's Crave for more on the Quantum ATM and I'm sure on whatever Jonathan Keats is up to in the future. Thanks again, Jonathan. Thank you.